Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. If you read Acts 19, you get a wild story about the beginning of the church at Ephesus. It's kind of amazing. Here's ordinary people beginning to embody Jesus there in that city. And people start listening to them. It starts to impact the market price of silver. There becomes a, a near riot. And the Christians are saved by a civil servant who asks the people to act like civilians, to act civil. It just isn't that interesting. It's a miracle when the ordinary people have the capacity to be the body of Christ. Something happens. I think there have been some miracles happen to people who gather at the corner of Pickerel Town Road and Washington Streets. At least there have been some things that I've observed. I've observed several people just kind of quietly caring for others. I've heard stories about how several of you really care for the people you work with. And I've heard stories about how people have taken some steps towards spiritual renewal, kind of saying, you know, I need to have God work on this with me. Or to look at their relationship with somebody else. I need to have some freedom and some forgiveness here. I'm telling you, when God starts to work in the lives of ordinary people, extraordinary things happen. And it's beginning to happen, at least I see. You see this all the time. But I come in and I begin to look for the ways that God is becoming visible. The Word becomes flesh and lives among us. Now if we pull back the curtain of the ordinary, we begin to see the extraordinary at work. And that's what the Apostle Paul is doing in the book of Ephesians. He's pulling back the curtain of the ordinary so that we can see the extraordinary at work. And what we begin to see is that God is pouring all of his creative power and attention into Jesus. And it is through Jesus that all of God's recreating power begin to work. We have a Jesus-shaped God. And when we believe that and, and live our beliefs, we become Jesus-shaped. There are other shaped gods that are among us, around us. We have, some people have American-shaped gods. And an American-shaped God looks like power and success and domination, and we are right. Or we have a Republican-shaped God, or a Democrat-shaped God, right? Where, where those agendas begin to shape who we are, and how we act and respond, and we're coming into a, a time in which we will be tested and tempted as to which shape God we are following. Which God is going to transform our lives, and develop us, and move us. And so, Paul says, in Christ, in him, in whom, over and over again, 11 times. That's how God is at work in this world. And one of the main things in chapter 1 that God is doing is that God is uniting all things together in Christ. That takes a miracle in our world. <laughs> Unite all things together in Christ. Are you kidding? It is impossible. Absolutely impossible. It's even getting worse. Unless there are groups of people in pockets around the world who are willing to believe what God is doing in Jesus. And that's not just a doctrinal statement, but like we talked about last Sunday, faith is really 
beginning to relax into God's love and mercy and forgiveness. And just like you can run your hand through water and you can say, it's impossible for the water to hold me up. And it is, unless you relax it and trust it. And so it is impossible for God's work to be done to unite all things together in Christ, to unite us together in Christ. It's impossible unless we relax into that faith that God, great love and mercy, has raised us to new life in Christ. And then we discover the buoyancy of the life of Christ is greater than the power of of evil and sin and injustice that drags us down. And then we hear that the blood of Christ has broken down the dividing walls of hostility. We have great news. In our world, that is fantastic news. That the Jews and the Greeks, the Gentiles, could come together. There was a huge wall there. <laughs> Look at all the huge walls in our world. I'm telling you, the power of Christ absorbed the powers that create those walls, and he hung on the cross, and God raised him from the dead so that the power we know that we live in and relax in and want to believe even more <coughs> And that power will raise us to the life of being united together in Christ. Amazing. It is an extraordinary power at work in ordinary people. Y'all are pretty ordinary, aren't you? So this extraordinary purpose of the church, Paul outlines in chapter 3, which is verse 10, he says... Now it is up to the church to make known the mystery of God, which is to unite all things together in Christ. Now, we had the Acts 19 story, this fantastic story, a wild story. Read it sometime, particularly this afternoon, not now, but read it. Read it, and you will see the fantastic story of the, of the church in Ephesus. Let me read you another story. This is from Revelation, chapter 2. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. I also know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up <coughs> under persecution, obviously, for the sake of my name, and that you have not grown weary. Good folk. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Now, many people who work with this scripture wonder what that love was that they abandoned. Because they've been faithful and abandoned in love. I don't think my idea is any better than anybody else's, but this is what has come to me as I listen for this week, the word this week. And that is the church at Ephesus was so interested and so focused on being faithful in the midst of persecution. And they were so focused on being faithful and obedient to Christ that they forgot the foundation of why they were enduring persecution and why they were being obedient. And that is Christ's love for them, their love for Jesus, and their desire to love one another. 
it's always difficult to maintain that focus. Because we get so focused on stuff that's around us that we're working hard at. We're trying to figure out how this church organization should work. We work hard at that. We're trying to figure out what it means to be in between pastors, and we're trying to figure that out, and how do we prepare for the next one, and we can become so focused on that that we can't forget. <coughs> what is the vine, and what is the branch, you know? And so really, it is a call to spiritual life and renewal, and I've been hitting on this theme, and I will continue to hit on it. Because it, it is basic, most basic. And chapter 4 then moves into building capacity to be the body of Christ. I invite you to turn over that chapter. Paul talks, out, talks about being imprisoned and he speaks out of that experience. And he's not letting that experience distract him. We lead a life worthy of the calling to which we've been called. In other words, we've been called to follow Jesus. And how do we do it? How do we build capacity to be the body of Jesus? How do we enlarge our heart and our relationships? How do we enlarge our vision for what it means to be the body of Christ with all humility and gentleness? <coughs> Patience. How long do we have to be patient with each other? How long will it take for you to agree with me? <laughs> so I gotta leave. I'm right, you're wrong at the door, you know. Gotta lay down that gun. Come walking freely into the, into the body. Make every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. telling you, I'm repeating what I have told you before, we are in for a battle, a spiritual battle in the next months, between now and November. You know what I'm talking about? Primary, the, the election. Millions of dollars are going into TV ads and radio talk shows and everywhere else. In fact, there were a couple pastors who were who were given money at the last election to come out in their large churches to, with particular stances. The power that is building dividing walls of hostility, it is there. And please do not deny it. And turn off your TVs and the radio talk shows. It is feeding, feeding the dividing walls of hostility. When you hear that stuff, turn it off and pray. Pray as the Apostle Paul teaches us at the end of Ephesians. Put on the spiritual armor. We're, we're in a serious battle because it is dividing churches. Are you going to let the Republican and Democrat split, split us? Those are the real questions. Who is shaping us? What God is shaping us? Is it the American shaped God? Or is it the Jesus shaped God? And those are good decisions to make that to be pretty clear and pretty firm about. 
make every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Why? Because there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Isn't that a great statement? We don't have to feel despairing about our situation because there is a God who is above all, in all, and through all, and is at work. And it is a tremendous witness for Christians who disagree and who are going to vote differently to love each other and not condemn each other. So what we're doing is having the attitudes that permit God to unite all things together in Christ. These attitudes enlarge our capacity for the love of Jesus and mercy of Jesus to come into our lives so that we can live that, we can embody that, and we can pass it on. <laughs> Part of building the capacity to be Jesus comes through in the gifts that are given. Each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. And what are the goals of the gift? Verse 13, until all of us come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, listen to this, to maturity, to the full measure, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. How do we enlarge our capacity? to become, to grow into the full stature of Christ. What is that stature of Christ? How did Christ operate in this world? One way he operated is by being sent. God sent him into the world, and he sent the disciples into the world. <coughs> that, that sense of being sent. And then you also have Jesus operating out of that, that uh, deep sense that he was one with God's will, and so he was teaching people he was helping people understand God's will and how to apply it. If you read the Sermon on the Mount, you see those applications. The applications to our anger, the applications to our lust, the applications, applications to our greed, the applications to the, the way we handle our anxiety about whether we have enough or not. Jesus was making the application of God's will. He was discerning that. And then we also have the fact that Jesus was sharing the good news. He was the evangelist. You know? He was out there saying and being the good news. It's good news that the kingdom of God is among us, that there's another kingdom around here, right? It's good news. There are two people, kingdoms are full. And then Jesus, you notice how he cared for people? How he protected people, guided people? how he reached across racial, ethnic, and language barriers to care for people, how he reached up to the upper crust and reached down to the lower crust and brought them together. That's what the Jews acted like a shepherd. And then he had taught them. Then he taught them how to apply them. They were walking down the road and we say, who's the greatest? Who has the best idea here? Who's right? Who's wrong? And Jesus said, wait a minute. That's not the way you do it. You serve one another. That's how you do it. Who's the most powerful here that we're asking? They were arguing and said, Jesus said, no. That's the way the world operates. In the kingdom, he operates so that's good news. Well, this list of gifts, some of the apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, those are gifts that are the full measure of Christ. And every church benefits by embodying these gifts. The gifts of being apostles, of being sent, the gifts of being of being prophets to discern God's will for a specific situation, the gifts of, of being uh, shepherds, uh, the, the gifts of being evangelists, you know, sharing the good news, finding ways to articulate, the, the, the gifts of being teachers. Those are the gifts that the body of Christ needs. 
Now, you all have shifted your organization towards that. And I commend you. But it's going to take quite a bit more to shift. Make those changes. But I, I commend you for this experiment because many people are saying, we've got to do church differently. It ain't working. It is not working in this era. We are in a new life situation, and the old ways of being church are not good news to the world around us. And so one of the, one of the temptations is to change organization, or at least change the names, but keep doing the same old thing. And my job, I don't know if you know this is the fine print of my job, uh, job description, but I'm to be your gadfly. Part of my job is to keep saying, fill out the body of Christ, stretch this capacity. And we'll try to figure it out. We're learning how to fly, or to build the planes and fly. And the, the elder group shifted towards this, this model. And then, you know, the plane couldn't get off the ground because a lot of changes happened. The pastor resigned at their first meeting. And so immediately they had to shift. They had to figure out, you know, where are the wheels we put on this thing, this plane? And so now we're just beginning, and that's part of my job, is to help them clarify what it means to, to lead the church into the apostle, into the sentence to lead the church in deciding God's will, to lead the church in shepherding one another, not just caring for one another that you do well when, when there's a specific physical, emotional needs, but also to care for the soul. How do we do the soul care here within this church? And how do we, how do we teach us? All of that is, is extremely important. And the purpose of those gifts are to equip us for the work of ministry, for the ministry of Christ, and to be the body of Christ, to act together like Jesus. And then there's kind of this new, I don't know if you call it a new attitude, new lifestyle. Anyway, Paul says, put on the new clothes. <laughs> Clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. I am a new person, but every once in a while the unredeemed Dwayne comes out to play. You know what I mean? Kind of the, the shadow side of my person comes spurting out. And so I need to continue that first love with Christ to be transformed. I'm not talking about trying harder. I'm not talking about shoulds and nots. I'm talking about taking in, breathing, the mercy, the love, and forgiveness of Christ so that we can breathe it out, exhale, we can express it, we can live it. So what are the new clothes? Well, put away falsehood. Don't speak or act falsely. You know, act who you are. Don't put on the phone. Just be yourself. Isn't that the best way? God wants us to be ourselves. <laughs> with him and with each other. Speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one of another. In other words, the way we treat each other is the way we are treating ourselves. Oops. Be angry. Oh, oh. But do not sin. Oh, I thought we weren't even supposed to be angry. 
Of course, anger is an emotion. It will flash out there. It's not something you control. It's there. But don't sin. Don't use it to berate people and to complain about people and gossip about people and drive people and run them down. No, we don't do that. It's not the new self. It's the old self that worked if we do that. Thieves must give up stealing. I can tell some stories about what we did with a couple of the kids in our church who were shoplifting. <laughs> but I don't think that's our issue. Our issue is more of keeping more to ourselves than what we need and giving, being less generous. I think I'm talking about generosity. Generosity is a wonderful spiritual practice that sets us free to receive the generosity of God. Let no evil talk come out of your mouth, but only what is useful for building up as there is need so that your words give grace to those who hear. Hmm. Interesting. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. How do you grieve the Holy Spirit of God? Well, if you go back up to verse um, 3, we are to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And so if we are not making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, we're grieving the Spirit, right? Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. In other words, don't harbor it. Don't let it sit and fester. It will raise your blood pressure. Your cholesterol will go up. You become less healthy. It impacts us more than it does the other when we maintain our anger towards somebody or someone. So we let that go and let God say, God, here it is. Heal this stuff. Heal. And then I love this verse. Learned it in kindergarten, probably in Sunday school. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. Act towards each other the way Jesus is acting towards you. Make sense? Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Talk about expanding the capacity, expanding the capacity of the body of Christ. This, this, this new self expands the capacity. And so we invite Christ to be part of our life. And so Paul prays this wonderful prayer in the Ephesians 3. He says, I pray that out of the richness of God's grace, you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through the Spirit. Your inner being. And that your hearts may be set in faith in Christ as you are being rooted and grounded in love. That's Paul's prayer. It's not something we do, but it's what Christ does within us. by the power at work among us. We learn what is the height and depth and length and breadth of the love of Christ. And, be, and we're filled with all the fairness of God. That's Paul's prayer. That's prayer. That's what happens when we pray for each other. Then the amazing thing happens <coughs> is that God does more than all we can ask or imagine. So we give him glory and praise. God, come to our assistance. Lord, make haste to help us. We give thanks to you, O God, for being at work among us, for enabling us to see those glimpses of the spirit of the living Christ among us.